going to give it another minute, let some uh, more people join. Good evening, everybody. Hope everybody is managing this, uh, this uh, pandemic as well as you can. It's a challenging time for all of us, for sure. Okay, so let me go ahead and uh, let me go ahead and get started. Um, so uh, I'm going to be uh, talking uh, about uh, what are called advanced directives, and I thought it was a very timely topic, given what we're going through. Uh, a lot of people, uh, justifiably, are very concerned, uh, concerned uh, not only about themselves but uh, about uh, other family members and loved ones, particularly, you know, particularly um, our, our seniors. Um, you know, I, for one, uh, my mother and father, we uh, are, are intentionally, my, my brother and sister and I are sort of keeping our distance, maintaining that social distance. But it also sort of brings to mind, well, gee, uh, what if they do get sick and they have to go to the hospital? You know, are, are the things in place that would allow family members to be able to help them and make decisions for them and so forth? And so uh, I thought this was a timely topic and, uh, and so what we're going to be talking about uh, are advanced directives, okay? So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, uh, basically give you an overview of, of advanced directives, you know, what they are, the different types of advanced uh, directives, and then, uh, and then uh, w once I get towards the end, I'll go ahead and take any questions that anybody has, okay? So, so let's talk about, um, first of all, the environment that we're living in, you know, this, this coronavirus. Um, you know, as communities mobilize to preserve public health in light of this outbreak, uh, you may have concerns, gee, how to uh, be legally protected. Uh, and regardless of whether the virus has affected you or anyone in your local area, uh, really now is a good time just to do a little um, sort of a you know, family audit, if you will, to make sure you have the legal documents uh, in, in place. Um, just in case this virus uh, might affect, uh, you know, you or your loved ones. You know, when a global health emergency hits home, many people are caught off guard because they don't have the legal authority uh, needed to step in and care for loved ones. So, so let's jump in. Uh, advanced directives, you may have heard the term advanced directives. What are they? Well, let me first um, sort of take a step back and, and explain the whole purpose behind advanced directives. Uh, you know, every, every, per every adult, every competent adult, you know, has the right to make decisions regarding uh, their health, including the right to either choose medical treatment or refuse medical treatment. And so when a person uh, becomes unable to make those decisions, whether due to uh, a physical change or a, or a mental change, you know, think coma, maybe dementia, uh, then they are considered uh, what's called incapacitated. They are legally incapacitated. They don't have the, the mental faculties or the, the, the ability to make these sorts of decisions for themselves anymore. Uh, and so to make sure that a person's uh, wishes about their health care will be honored after they become incapacitated, Florida has a law that allows people to make what are called advanced directives, healthcare advanced directives, where they set in place directives in advance of becoming, incapac of, of becoming incapacitated. So, so advanced directives generally include things like instructing doctors uh, to uh, maybe either provide uh, uh, procedures, withhold procedures, or maybe even withdraw procedures that are already being administered. Uh, designating uh, someone to make medical decisions for you if you can't, uh, and instruct, instructing uh, um, or giving instructions about what are called anatomical donations, anatomical, think organ and tissue donation. So those are three general categories uh, that advanced directives fall into. Now, some people wait until they're sick or diagnosed with a, a life-threatening uh, illness uh, before making an advanced directive, while other people do it ahead of time while they're still healthy. And that's often done as part of sort of broader estate planning, getting a will or trust. We will uh, typically um, uh, also put together these advanced directives. So again, some people wait until they are on the doorstep of the hospital. Other people plan ahead. Which do you think is better? So, um, 
So I mentioned there are three categories, uh, if you will, of advanced directives. So, so that means there are basically three types of advanced directives. One is what's called a healthcare surrogate designation. Some people also refer to it as a healthcare power of attorney, okay? The, the second is what's called a living will, a living will. And third, an anatomical donation. Again, donating tissues and organs. So let me, let me, um, let me uh, dive in a little bit on each of these. First, a healthcare surrogate designation. Again, also known as a healthcare power of attorney. Uh, this is where you can appoint someone to uh, make medical decisions and give informed consent. Now, the question is, should you appoint just one person as your healthcare agent or surrogate? Um, or should you appoint more than one? Well, there's a couple of different schools of thought. One school of thought is, well, just to appoint one person, so they have the sole decision making, and then you can appoint a backup, maybe a first backup and a second backup, but that first backup would only step in and serve as that agent if the primary agent can't do the job for whatever reason. Maybe, maybe they're sick, maybe they're incapacitated, maybe they've passed away, maybe, maybe they don't wanna do it. There's another school of thought uh, which is to appoint multiple people at the same time, what are called co-agents, and give each of them the independent authority <clears throat> to act. Uh, maybe allowing another co-agent to block or veto a decision, but giving each an independent authority. Well, think about it, and, and I think this coronavirus situation really brings to light uh, the importance uh, of that. And frankly, that's my preference. Let's appoint uh, multiple co-agents, okay? Because think about it, um, you know, who's, whoever is first on the scene in the emergency situation is able to act and lobby for the, the patient, including choosing specialist doctors while the patient is still in the ER or intensive care, uh, reviewing medical charts, uh, medications, treatment options, uh, making sure all doctors and professionals are involved with the treatment that, that are involved are coordinating with one another. So think about it, with this virus outbreak, if you don't have multiple co-agents acting at one time, but you just have one uh, agent, what if that healthcare agent is sick? Or if not sick, but they're self-quarantining and now a loved one needs to go to the hospital, well, that person can't get to the hospital to carry out their healthcare agent responsibilities. So this way, uh, appointing multiple co-agents, then it's whoever is first to get to the hospital uh, uh, can act, okay? Now, a healthcare power of attorney, healthcare surrogate designation, again, all the same. It grants authority either immediately or it waits until the person is incapacitated. So those are two different kinds and you have to be um, uh, cognizant of which kind uh, um, is being uh, discussed with you or presented to you. Again, some are effective right away and others are only effective at the point that you become incapacitated. Now, what are some of the, the, these powers that a healthcare agent may have? Well, a power over medical records, uh, maybe decisions over long-term care or hospice care, pain relief um, um, decisions, and so forth. So it's a broad array of medically and health-related decisions, okay? Now, a lot of these healthcare powers of attorney will also say something like this. Um, if, um, let's say I am assigning, uh, I, I am executing this healthcare power of attorney, appointing somebody as my agent, it will typically say, uh, if I become incapacitated, there is no need to appoint a legal guardian of me because the person I've appointed as the agent can, can, can act in that role just fine. No need to go through the court process of a legal guardian. But it may also go on to say, but if a legal guardian is deemed to be necessary for whatever reason, then I want this person that I am hereby appointing as my agent in this document, I want them to be appointed by the court as my legal guardian. Again, something to be mindful of. Um, the way these works is that in order for it to be valid, it has to be uh, witnessed by two people, okay? One of whom cannot be a spouse or a blood relative, okay? Um, and and. And so once you put this together, it's very helpful. In fact, it's, it, it, it's, it's, I always recommend this. Make sure that you tell the agent that you've appointed that you've done that and give them a copy of it. Why keep them in the dark? You should also give copies to doctors 
any doctor uh, that you regularly go to, um, bring a copy uh, at your next doctor appointment and say, I want you to put this in my permanent medical record. Okay. Now, um, before moving on to the next advanced directive, uh, uh, a very helpful improvement in the law that happened in 2015, and that is that parents can, can, can prepare a healthcare power of attorney or a healthcare surrogate designation for a minor child, okay? So why might that be helpful or important? Well, let's say the parents are planning on traveling and leaving the kids home with a family member or babysitter or whatnot. Well, while they are away, if the child um, needs care, then you can appoint someone to be able to make that medical decision for them, okay? Or let's say uh, the other scenario might be that the child is traveling, let's say on a, uh, you know, on a field trip with the school, you can, um, as the parent sign a healthcare surrogate designation appointing someone to make the medical decisions for your child while your child is is, is out of the house, okay? Okay, now I wanna take a minute and talk about HIPAA. I'm sure many of you have heard of HIPAA. HIPAA is the medical record privacy law. Uh, it limits the, um, the uh, release of what's called protected health information, protected health information, okay? Um, that is really uh, medical information that's unique to each of us and that is kept private. Um, <clears throat> In this healthcare surrogate designation, you are able to say, although HIPAA protects my information, I want certain people to have access to it because if I'm at the point where I'm incapacitated, okay, I want people to have access to this information. So, uh, so many of these healthcare surrogate designations, healthcare powers of attorney, will include what we call a HIPAA waiver where you are basically waiving your right to the privacy under the HIPAA law and saying, the people that I'm listing here, I want to have access to my medical records. Uh, so you're saying, doctor, you are to release the medical record. Doctor, you are to talk to these people when they call you, okay? Now, uh, sometimes this HIPAA waiver is included within the healthcare power of attorney. I will tell you that my preference here at, at, at my practice um, is to um, is to uh, include it as is to make it a separate document, and here's why. I've had situations where a client says, "Well, I am more than happy to have a fairly long list of family members that I want to give access to my medical records and get around the HIPAA uh, privacy restrictions, but I don't want all of those same people listed as my healthcare agent." And so the list might be shorter for uh, the uh, people that, that you are authorizing to make medical decisions. So that's why we break it out into two separate documents, a healthcare power of attorney and a separate HIPAA release, okay? Now, the next advanced directive uh, is called a living will, a living will. Now, don't confuse it with a last will and testament. Many people have heard of a last will and testament. That, that deals with your stuff. That deals with your stuff, how you're passing your assets, your property, and, and so forth to your loved ones. No, a living will is different. A living will, a living will, um, think of it as the end of life document. So it's a written statement about the kind of medical care or treatment that you want or that you don't want at the end of life. So a living will says essentially the following. Uh, first of all, if you have one of three medical conditions. You either are in a persistent vegetative state, number one. Number two, you have an, what's called an end stage condition, think kidney failure, renal failure, or if you have a terminal condition. If you ha have one of those three conditions, as determined, by, um, as determined by two doctors, which consist of your primary doctor and another consulting doctor, if those doctors determine you to be in one of those three conditions, and if those doctors also determine that there's no hope of recovery from that condition. And if they also determine that uh, to give whatever medical treatment is being considered at the time is only going to prolong the dying process. If the doctors sort of make that, that uh, determination, then the living will says it's appropriate to withhold the medical treatment, okay? So what might some life prolonging procedures be? Well, things like ventilators, uh, pacemakers, dialysis, 
uh, mechanical devices, surgeries, um, blood transfusions, antibiotics, CPR, those sorts of things, okay? So again, if all those circumstances are, are, are met and the doctors have arrived at that determination, then the living will instructs the medical community withhold those life prolonging procedures, okay? Very important. The living will typically will also say, even though those life, uh, uh, you know, those life prolonging procedures can be withheld, uh, that you still want comfort care and pain, uh, pain relief. Now, one issue to be careful of with living wills, and that is how is food and water dealt with? How is food and water dealt with? Many living wills that are out there will treat food and water They'll put it in the same category as medical treatment, something that can be withheld. Uh, you may want to learn more about this issue, and really, it, it, a lot of it boils down to what your particular, you know, your personal view is. Uh, you know, some people say, "Look, the quicker you end life, the better," but there are other people that say, "Well, no, I don't want to be starved to death or dehydrated to death, so I want the food and water, what's called nutrition and hydration." And so, um, so that group of people will say, "Look, you know." I want a different kind of living will than that sort of standard living will that treats food and water like medical treatment. Um, and so this, this alternative form of living will would say, even if I, as the patient, can no longer receive a nutrition and hydration orally, but can only receive it you know, intravenously, I still want it because I don't want to be starved to death, unless it's going to cause other complications, uh, such as uh, it's been explained to me, you know, once a person starts the dying process and the body starts shutting down, then it would be more harmful than helpful to, um, to provide that nutrition and hydration, you know, um, or, you know, picture maybe somebody with dementia or Alzheimer's, and if they have uh, an intravenous tube, they might get confused at the sensation of a tube and try pulling it out, and it may cause other complications. So in those circumstances, it would be appropriate to withhold, otherwise it's to be given. So again, just be aware of the fact that there, there are generally two, sort of two views of that and two different um, types of living will that address that issue differently, okay? Now, uh, let's, let's move to the uh, anatomical um, donation. Anatom again, donating tissues and organs, okay? So you can generally um, um, make uh, the following decisions. You can decide okay, I'd like my organs and tissue donated for any purpose at all. You may decide, well, I want to donate, but just for uh, transplantation purposes, for transplants. You may say, well, I just want, I want it donated, but just for research purposes, okay? Or you can say, no, I don't want them donated at all. So then that, you know, th 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 there would not be an anatomical donation um, uh, instrument in place, okay? I will tell you that my preference here at, at, at my law practice here is to include the anatomical um, um, preference issue within the context of the healthcare power of attorney and where it can say, yeah, I want to donate for any reason. I want to donate just for research, just for transplant, or uh, I want there to be a prohibition on donation. So you tell the world, no, I don't want it. You know, don't, don't want them donated. So that's the uh, anatomical donation, okay? Now, uh, let's move on to something that many people have heard of, which is called a DNR, a DNR, a, a do not resuscitate order. Um, this is used by people who don't wanna be resuscitated in the event of either a respiratory or cardiac arrest. In other words, no CPR, all right? And it's typically used by people that have a terminal condition or an end-stage condition and, and, and so forth, okay? This is a very specific legal document, okay, uh, that has to be put on a very specific form, okay? It's a form that, that is um, put out by the, the, the Department of Health, okay? Um, and there are very specific requirements. First and foremost, it has to be on yellow paper, believe it or not. And actually, I've, I've got one here. I'm gonna go ahead and put it up to the camera. See this yellow paper? If it is on white paper, it does not qualify. It has to be on yellow paper, the form that the State Department of Health uh, uses. And if now it is going to be 
utilized in an emergency situation. It not only has to be on that yellow paper, but it has to be in plain view, in plain view. So for example, um, on the refrigerator in the home, or maybe at the foot of the bed, and, and emergency personnel, they're actually trained to look at several places throughout the house to try to find it. But if they have to go digging for it, they're not gonna do that. Because remember, emergency personnel, paramedics, when they show up at the house, they are <clears throat> instructed to resuscitate you. They are instructed to resuscitate you unless they see that DNR, that specific form, in plain view. This form here, this form is not something you get from the lawyer. You get this from the doctor. So it's signed by the patient <clears throat> or maybe the patient's healthcare agent or surrogate and the doctor, okay? It doesn't need to be notarized or witnessed, so it's a pretty simple form to have filled out. And you can make copies if you want to put them in multiple places, but you've got to make copies on yellow paper. So yellow, yellow, yellow. Now, why might you get a DNR? Why might you get a DNR? Um, so from what I have uh, been told, if you have an elderly person that uh, is in cardiac or pulmonary arrest uh, and, and, and uh, paramedics show up, they don't see a DNR, so they resuscitate. That is very traumatic to the elderly person. It is not uncommon for there to be multiple broken ribs as they're doing CPR. And so that often will lead to uh, more complications after the fact and a, and, and, uh, a lower quality of life. Okay, so uh, what a DNR would do is say, if I'm in that situation, I'd rather not have to go through that, okay? Remember, even if a DNR is in place and the paramedics show up, they will still provide you know, a comfort care such as oxygen, hemorrhage control, pain medication, and so forth. Now, the DNR, once done, never expires, and it can be revoked after you've signed it. It can be revoked by the person uh, the patient or by the healthcare uh, agent, either by physically destroying it, tearing it up, or by orally expressing a different intent. So if you had, you know, if the patient needs resuscitation, let's say the DNR is on the refrigerator, paramedics show up into the house. If the patient is able to speak, patient may say orally, ignore that DNR, I want you to resuscitate. Or the healthcare agent can orally express uh, a desire uh, to, uh, to, um, basically revoke that DNR, okay? Now, important, this DNR form is only valid in Florida. So if your senior loved one is gonna be traveling in another state, you'd have to get that state's version of the DNR, okay? Now, how is a DNR different from a living will? Told you about a living will, told you about a DNR, how are they different? DNR deals with emergency situations where the living will deals with a non-emergency situation, a much broader range of end-of-life issues, okay? So again, DNR, you are in an emergency, um, CPR needs to be administered, living will, not so. Okay, now what I'd like to do um, uh, is um, I want to spend a couple of minutes um, talking about something that technically is not an advanced directive, but it is part of sort of the, the, the grouping of advanced directive documents that are very, very important. And that is what's called a durable financial power of attorney. This is a, a, a document, a power of attorney, that's a legal document that delegates authority from one person to another to make financial decisions. Uh, this is often called a POA for short. The person that signs the POA is called the principal. And the person that is granted the power under the POA is called the agent. Sometimes in certain powers of attorney, they're called not an agent, but an attorney in fact. Don't be confused. It does not mean that the, the person that is being uh, uh, granted the power has to be an attorney. In fact, it typically is not an attorney, but sometimes it's called an attorney in fact. Just don't be uh, tripped up by that, okay? Now, an agent under a power of attorney has a very important legal duty, the highest legal duty under the law, a duty owed to the principal, the one that signed the power of attorney. And this is called 
a fiduciary duty, which means the agent must act in the principal's best interest. Now, what authority is granted to the agent depends on the language in the POA. There are two types. There's a general power of attorney and a limited power of attorney. A general POA is very broad, and it grants the agent very broad powers to perform virtually any legal act on behalf of the principal. A limited power of attorney is very narrow, and it only authorizes the agent to conduct uh, a specific act. So for an example would be, let's say you had, a, had a, a home in another state that had to be sold, you could empower someone else to act on your behalf in that state uh, and, and do a limited power of attorney where you're just granting them power for that specific transaction and nothing, nothing else. So these, these, these durable financial powers of attorney are often made to authorize someone to uh, make important financial decisions for such as banking transactions, investment transactions, signing a contract or other legal document for you, transferring money, buying or selling a car, a home, those sorts of, that's just, a, that's just a, sort of a brief list of the many powers that you can grant an agent under a power of attorney. Now, there are certain powers of a, certain powers under a POA that you can never grant to somebody else. It doesn't work under the law in Florida. And let me mention one in particular. A power of attorney cannot grant an agent the power to do a will for the principal, a last will and testament. Can't do it. Can't do it. Interestingly, though, that under a power of attorney, you can grant an agent to put a trust together for you. Not a will, but they can do a trust together for you if the power of attorney authorizes it and if the trust also also authorizes it. But again, they cannot do a will. So if you get to the point or your family member gets to the point where they no longer have legal capacity to put together a will themselves, uh, but maybe they had signed a power of attorney, that power of attorney is not going to allow the agent, who might be a child or, or a spouse, will not allow them to do a will. Okay? Now, um, I called this a durable financial power of attorney. Well, what the heck does the word durable mean? Well, it simply means that the POA continues in effect after somebody becomes incapacitated. If it's not a durable power of attorney, then it ends, it terminates once the principal becomes incapacitated. So that's why you rarely see a power of attorney that's not a durable power of attorney. It otherwise wouldn't make any sense to do one, frankly. Uh, now, to be valid in Florida, a power of attorney needs two witnesses as well as a notary, okay? Um, now, it's important to, 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 to note that somebody who signs a power of attorney needs the <clears throat> mental capability to do that, what's called the legal capacity to do that. Uh, and frankly, we often have to make a determination whether somebody who may be in the early stages of declining mental you know, cognitive ability still has the legal capacity to sign a power of attorney. A lot of times the family is concerned and they sort of rush in, mom or dad, uh, really want to get this done. Um, they're not sure if mom or dad can sign those documents. And so I'm sort of trained to make that determination um, as to whether they do. And frankly, you'd be surprised that not a whole lot of cognitive ability needs to exist in order to sign a power of attorney or even a will or a trust uh, for that, uh, that much. The, 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 the level of, of cognitive ability and awareness is a whole lot lower than you might think. And so oftentimes the family is relieved to hear, gee, I never thought in a million years that mom or dad would be able to sign these legal documents. And now you tell me that they're able to do it well, let's get on with it. Let's do it quickly before there's further decline. Now, a durable power of attorney is effective on the very day that you sign it. Even though you may still have legal capacity, it's effective on the day that you sign it, okay? Uh, that, the reason why that's important is because there was a time before 2011, for example, where we, we made different powers of attorney, where, where you could sign a power of attorney appointing so-and-so as your agent, but we could add a clause at the end that said, this is not effective unless and until. 
I become incapacitated. So there was no concern that the person you were appointing uh, might walk it down to the bank, present it to the teller or the branch manager and say, I hold power of attorney. I want to pull money out of the account. There was never that concern before 2011. That kind of power of attorney is what we used to call a springing power of attorney because you would sign it, but then basically put it in the drawer and nobody could use it. The agent couldn't use it unless and until you became incapacitated. And at that point in time, the drawer would open and it would pop up, it would spring to life. Springing powers of attorney were done away with in 2011. Now they're effective on day one. So now you have to ask yourself, <clears throat> okay, do I trust the person that I'm appointing as my agent? And so sometimes that's a, you know, a difficult conversation. Um, also that new law in 2011, another very important change that we've are now living with in the, over the last nine years is that there is a, a certain group or subset of powers that are called superpowers. Superpowers. Um, powers that basically would grant an agent to do effective planning uh, for you if you can't, let's say, financial planning, estate planning. Well, these are called superpowers because, because the new law requires that when you sign a power of attorney, you actually have to make an actual choice whether you want to grant those powers or not. How, how would you reflect that choice? By putting initials next to each one of those powers. And our power of attorney has about five running pages where you do a bunch of initialing. Um, if you don't initial those, then you're, not, you're deemed to have not granted those powers. And why is that important? Because you know we often will uh, uh, come across somebody, let's say from another state, where that state doesn't have superpowers in their power of attorney statute. So they're dealing with a deficient power of attorney or maybe a power of attorney done in Florida before 2011. So very, very, very important to make sure your power of attorney is, is sort of caught up, okay? So, you know, you may ask yourself, is your power of attorney, uh, uh, do you have one? Is it in place? Um, is it adequate? Um, so, uh, you know, those pre-printed forms often are inadequate. And when it come, push comes to shove and a family member who's holding the POA, who was appointed as the agent, where the principal no longer has capacity and they try to use it for one purpose or another and they're denied. So guess what has to happen? we're stuck in the guardianship court system. So very, very important. So uh, what I'd like to do uh, is um, uh, tell you that these advanced directives, as well as the durable power of attorney, is often made as part of what's called good estate planning. So often when we put a, a last will and testament in place, or maybe uh, alternatively a uh, revocable living trust in place, we will include these advanced directives and powers of a, attorney. So we here at Legacy Planning Law Group do things like wills and trusts and estates. We also do a lot of elder law planning where we help our seniors as well as a lot of probate and trust administration where perhaps a family member did not plan well enough and the family is stuck in the probate court or they're administering a, a trust. But back to the advanced directives, <clears throat> realizing how important it is to have these documents, these important documents readily accessible, we make a wonderful sort of tool or platform available to, uh, to uh, our clients. So for our clients to put a trust in place at a certain level of trust planning, we set them up in our secure client portal, in our secure client portal. So, so they are able to upload, we actually upload for them uh, to the portal, not only all of their signed estate planning documents, but also all of their advanced directives and they're all uploaded to their private account on our portal okay so a picture that a client's private portal account cons consists of two buckets bucket one has all of their estate planning documents their will their trust their other ancillary documents okay bucket two just has their advanced directives and their durable power of attorney okay and so um it is this second bucket the advanced directives and the poas that may need to be accessed quickly, perhaps on an emergency basis. So to help that process in that situation, what we do is again, for these clients that are eligible for our client portal service, we issue them a health ID card, uh, an ID card uh, that they can keep in their wallets like the size of a credit card, 
uh, their wallet or their purse, okay? And actually, I have a sample here. It's, it's bigger than the, uh, the uh, credit card size, but um, I could not find on short notice uh, our credit card size uh, but, um, card, but this is the bigger one. So as you can see on the outside, on the top it says emergency medical card. It has the name of the person and it has a username and PIN, a username and PIN that emergency personnel pulling this card out of your wallet can go to this website on the back, which is, which is basically our portal. It's an extension of our website, but it's our secure portal. They go to this right on the spot they enter this username and PIN right there, and they can access the healthcare power of attorney, the living will, uh, you know, all of these advanced directives, as well as the durable power of attorney. And it's a wonderful tool, whether it's EMS on the spot, whether it's the emergency uh, room uh, physician. Um, um, uh, it, again, it's a wonderful tool. But of course, this second bucket, accessible by this card, they can only access the advanced directives in the POA. They cannot access the uh, other estate planning documents. That is sort of a, that's the other side of the portal that's not accessible by this, uh, by, this, by this tool here, okay? So I have to tell you, our clients really love this secure portal and, uh, and especially love having that, uh, that uh, ID card uh, in their wallet or their purse, okay? So, um, so that sort of brings us uh, to the uh, end of uh, our time together. And um, before opening up to questions, let me just say that if you are interested in uh, learning more about our secure client portal, uh, or even about you know the advanced directives that, that we have, or, or generally our estate planning services, wills and trusts and estates, I'd encourage you to book a, a free 15 minute phone call with my team. You can do that either in the book a call feature in the chat box. You can also schedule a, um, a phone call through the book now button uh, um, on the Facebook page or the book buttons that are under the featured services section on the Facebook page. Or if you'd like, you can go to uh, our website. Uh, there are um, a number of places where you can click on a button to book a, a 15 minute call, a free 15 minute call. Again, on our website, legacyplanninglawgroup.com. So with that, uh, I'd be happy to uh, go ahead and uh, See if I have any uh, questions. Hey, Rich.